going to talk today about the Mossad, the KJB, about Judaism in Russia, but I want to begin with a story. About 20 years ago, I was in Tel Aviv in a memorial for the Rebbe, 30 days after Gimel Thomas, after the Rebbe's passing, and the, the keynote speaker was Yitzhak Shamir, who was then the former Prime Minister of Israel. And he got up and he said something very interesting. He said that when, the, when the, he was a member of the Mossad for many years, and the Mossad started coming to Russia in the 1950s, they discovered there was already a secret underground network in place. It wasn't an underground network run by the Russian government because the Russian, the, by the Israelis, it was an underground network run by Chabad. That same system that had been established by the Rebbe in the early 20s continued on all throughout the communist period. And when the Mossad comes to Russia, and how do they come? As the Israelis opened up, in the in the in the uh, in, in the in the in, in the, the diplomatic corps in Moscow, etc., etc., and they opened up an embassy. They made a decision, a conscious decision, that they would run an underground network in Russia. Now, this underground network was run by a division of the of the Mossad, which is also in the in the Prime Minister's office, called the Shkata Kesher, which means the Office of Connection. Till to that, uh, by the way, the same Lishkata Kesher was the same organization that ran Pollard here in the United States, the same division of the Mossad. Golda Meir discovered a Jewish underground that existed already in Russia that began in 1920 when the communism came in and the previous rebbe decided to do battle against them. And in 1924, he took ten chassid, nine chassidim in himself and they, they swore an oath to keep Judaism alive in Russia to their last breath. Some of the, I would imagine that some of the grandchildren of, that, of those people who took the oath were here during the retreat as presenters or as guests or participating in the retreat. And he decided that he is going to fight to keep Judaism alive in Russia no matter what. And what was going on at the time, Jews were underneath tremendous oppression. Many of the other great rabbinic leaders at the time who had the yeshivas in Russia, the Chavetz Chaim, the saintly Chavetz Chaim, and many others of Shimshin Shimon Skop, they took their yeshivas and they moved across the border to Lithuania. And what the Rebbe said is, I'm not going to leave Russian Jewry, I'm going to take care of them. And he takes these nine Hasidim and he swears an oath to the death to keep Judaism alive in Russia. And he begins a process of building Judaism in Russia. And this, and this was schools and chadorim and yeshivas. And uh, he would open a school and the KGB would close it. He would send a rabbi to a community and they would arrest him. It was a process that went on and on for many, many years. What we don't know about the Chabad system in Russia from the Chabad side, we know about it from the other side. We know a little bit from the Chabad side. Most we know is from the testimonies and the accounts written by members of the Israeli Secret Service. Because the Chabad side, everything was a total secret. Nothing was done publicly. Everything was done four eyes in the Rebbe's office. The Rebbe's secretaries knew nothing about what was going on. Nobody knew anything. Everything was an absolute secret. And a lot of those people that were involved in the process are no longer in this world. So Lebanon now, because every Friday in the bathhouse they meet. Letters and communications and things that need to come from Russia to go to New York to ask the Rebbe questions are sent through the Israeli government in the diplomatic pouch. And this process goes on for years until 1967. The Israeli government is the conduit for books, for materials. They're shipping in stuff. They're doing things and they're working quietly together. What did Lebanon say? He said that this was a system that like, was nothing like they had. It was in every city and every town. It reached into the communities one after another. And it was really an amazing system. The Mossad's cooperation with the Rebbe continued in Russia in many different kinds of ways. Even afterwards, it continued much further on. After 1967, when the Israelis lost the embassy because diplomatic, relationships, diplomatic relations were closed between Russia and Israel, he says the Rebbe had a better system of intelligence in Russia than we did. In April of 1985, three weeks after Gorbachev is named the premier of Russia, Professor Herman Bronover, who some of you may know, who was a very well-known Russian professor, he was paid a very high ransom to get out of Russia, the Rebbe calls him in, he wants to speak to him. And this is what he tells him. He says to him, the gates of Russia are going to come down soon, the Jews of Russia are going to be released, I don't want you to call the media, 
I want you to call the Jews in Russia, your contacts in Russia. Bronover was a big activist. It was a group of different Jewish organizations, Shamir, Chama, Chama, Chama Ezusachim. These are different Chabad organizations that were doing secret work in Russia. And Bronover was one of the prime activists. I want you to call the Jews in Russia, and I want you to tell them that soon they're going to leave the country and everything's going to change. He's astounded. Gorbachev is prime minister, premier, three weeks. He gets on the phone. He calls some activists in Moscow. And the guy tells him, listen, there's a KGB car in front of my house right now. My wife was taken in for questioning. And the sense of disbelief is beyond belief. The next day, he writes in a report to the Rebbe that he made a series of calls. And he says, nobody believes it. And the Rebbe says, the change is underway, but it's just not apparent. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. We all know what Gorbachev did, that Gorbachev went in the late 80s, early 90s, he changed the policy of the former Soviet Union, and he allowed Jews to leave. Now the Soviets themselves may, in a limited way, be coming to understand the importance of freedom. We hear much from Moscow about a new policy of reform and openness. Some political prisoners have been released. If you go back to the 80s, Senator Henry Scoop Jackson got a bill through Congress allowing the immigration of Soviet Jews to the United States at a time when immigration had been highly restricted. We'll honor the right of a person to leave a country freely and return freely, just as clear as anything can be. The Russians saw it as an opportunity to open their jails. And that's when you see members of Russian organized crime come to the United States for the very, very first time. In June of 1992, Gorbachev comes to Ben-Gurion University in the Negev to get an honorary degree. One of the professors at Ben-Gurion University is Herman Bronover. The president of Ben-Gurion University asked Herman Bronover, would he please be the personal host and take Gorbachev around his visit to Ben-Gurion University? in the Negev. He tells him, fine. In the middle of the visit, he says, I have to tell you a story. He tells him in 1985, he tells him the, the exact, in, in April of 1985, the Rebbe called me in, he told me this whole story, blah, 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 etc., etc. And he tells this to Gorbachev. So Gorbachev turns to him and he says to him, how could he know if I didn't know? A year later, he's in Oxford. Peter Combs, the father-in-law of Heshi Epstein, who was, an at, who was the president of Shamir, tells Gorbachev the same story about what happened in April of 1985. And Gorbachev tells Peter Combs, how could he know if I didn't know? The story has been verified from two different historical sources. <laughs> ואני רואה שאנחנו קונים את מנהטן, וקונים את הונגריה, וקונים את רומניה, וקונים את פולין. אז אין בעיות לנו, אני מבין שהכישרונות והקשרים והתנופה מגיע כמעט לכל מקום. וזה באמת מעניין. מעניין מפני שאנחנו ארץ קטנה, בסך הכל. וכנראה שקשה לנו מאוד יהיה להיות ארץ תעשייתית. פשוט אין לנו מספיק שוק מקומי גדול בשביל לעשות תעשייה מקומית. for many nations, and then, so that as all these nations will live in good peace, in harmony, and every one of them will strengthen all these nations around him, especially in things of charity. Amen. Oh, God I bless you. I hope that in the near future, the melting pot will be so active that it will be not necessary to undermine every time that they are the 
of good things you know, around them and uh, around, especially beginning by themselves and their families. I said before, I'm not so happy about the underlining. They say they break clean on one side, in Manhattan on the second side. And then there are all the people in the Hispanic, etc. On the third side, which is a, which is a real melting pot, it certainly it must be a melting pot for all good things. There's no difference here. Vorstellung von Präsident George Herbert Walker Ben Doherty. Vorstellung. Ja, ja, ja. Ich habe mich nicht mehr gefragt, about eight, nine years ago, President Bush went to St. Petersburg. He traveled on an official visit to, the, to, to, to Russia. And I'll tell you a story within the story. So he gets to Moscow, and he's in the, he's in the, um, he's in the embassy. And in the embassy, he's, there's a reception, and the chief rabbi of Russia, Beryl Lazar, is there at the reception. And he goes by him together, one of the, one of the other rabbis, Ari Berkowitz. And the president turns to his aide and he says, Tell Ari his buddies are here. Who is Ari? Ari, what's the name of the spokesman of the White House in those days? Is Ari uh, Fleischer. Ari Fleischer was the, pro was the spokesman in the White House. And when he was a little bit younger, he had been the president of the uh, Congressional Jewish Forum, which was a Chabad organization on, on, uh, in Congress. So he knew that Ari was connected to Chabad. So the president saw the two Chabad rabbis. He says, he tells his aide, tell Ari his buddies are here. Fleischer comes running in like a Meshuggah. The, the president wants him. He's told the president wants to know that the Chabad rabbis are here to see him. But, so what happened to that visit is he went to St. Petersburg. And in St. Petersburg, he visited the great Choral Synagogue in St. Petersburg, which was built by Rabbi Pesner. And in that synagogue, Rabbi Pesner takes him into a room and shows him a whole bunch of Torah scrolls. What is the story with these Torah scrolls? When these rabbis came in the mid-60s, they discovered these Torah scrolls. And they had an idea, you know what, nobody's using them in Russia. Let's take them out of Russia. We'll spread them around the world and there'll be Torah scrolls for synagogues, safer Torahs for shuls. And they told the Rebbe and the Rebbe said, no. This, there'll be a time, that there'll be a renaissance of Judaism in Russia. And these Torah scrolls will be used in Russia. And when they told the story to President Bush, he said, that's a prophecy. And he was so taken with the, with the, with the rabbi and rabbits in, in, in what's his name, in St. Petersburg, he invited them to the, to the White House as his private personal guests. Barbara Bush, his, I mean, what's his name, Mrs. Bush was so taken by the rabbits and Pesner that they, she invited her to the White House as a personal guest. The difference between Poland and Russia is Russia is a vibrant, dynamic Jewish community. I was in Moscow on Simchas Torah night. There were a thousand people there. There were 13 oligarchs in the room. Their net worth was 30 some odd billion dollars. Now, what shul in America has people worth $30 billion in the shul for dancing? At 3.30, at 4, so we were dancing till 11 o'clock, and then we had a break, and then we had a, the dancing again. At 3 o'clock in the morning, we went on the street, and at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm walking home with Rabbi Lazar. You'd think he'd be impressed that he had these oligarchs worth $30 billion. He's, I said to, he said to me, I had success tonight. I said, what was your success? He says, three guys decided to get a bris, and three guys or four guys decided to put on tefillin. But we're talking here a different kind of world. You know, they have a row of Mercedes in front of the shul, each guy with a driver and bodyguards, and these guys are dancing inside like everybody else. They run the economy of Russia. The difference is we're the Jewish establishment in Russia. There's no Jewish federation. We are the Jewish federation. There's no ADL. We are the ADL. There's no AJC. We are the AJC. Judaism in Russia is run 98% by Chabad. It's a different ballgame. It is the most amazing Jewish community that I've ever been to in my life. It is so well organized. There's schools in this town with 1,000 students, with 50,000 Jews. It's an amazing place. I mean, now there's challenges, and, and everything in the city is run by Jews. The shopping centers are owned by Jews. The airline is, the, both airlines are owned by a Jew. The banks are owned by Jews. The gas stations are owned by Jews. The whole downtown, everything is owned by these oligarchs. In fact, the governor now, on behalf of Ukraine, is one of these, these, these oligarchs. One of the other elements for the success of Judaism in Russia, even though he's not so popular right now in the United States, has been the friendship of, to the Jewish world of the president of Russia, which is Vladimir Putin. And you have to ask yourselves, why is this so? I heard a great line from a professor of mathematics, Novus Sabirsk. He told me like this, Putin may not be good for Russia, but he's definitely good for the Jews of Russia. Putin may not be good for Russia, but he's definitely good for the Jews of Russia. Why is he good for the Jews of Russia? Because when Putin was a young child, 
He lived in an apartment building in St. Petersburg. And he would come home every day from school that his parents were out working. And in the same entrance, in the same apartment or the adjacent apartment, there lived a religious Hasidic family. And when he would come home and there was nobody to take care of him, they would do his homework together with him. And he spent his youth growing up basically in the house of an Orthodox Jew. So he feels a tremendous sense of hakora satoiv, of a recognition for good for, to, the, to the Jews and what he got. All his childhood friends were Jews. And I also think he sees the positive effect that they have in building Russia as a new country, the fact that what the rabbis do in Russia and the shluchim are doing in Russia. Russia is a different mentality. And this is part of the conflict right now between Russia and the United States. You can't push the Ru Russians have to be dealt with, with through quiet. One, a very shrewd observer in Moscow told me, you can't deal with Russia like the United States. Here it's public pressure, it's tumult, it's polls. In Russia, everything is quiet deals. For instance, there is a lot of quiet deals between Russia and Israel that you know nothing about. And the early meetings between, uh, between uh, Putin and, and Sharon and Putin and, uh, and, and, uh, and Bibi were orchestrated by Chabad. They were arranged. But a lot of the deals, everything, it, it, Russia is a different co political mentality. There is a lot of quiet deals between Russia and Israel that you know nothing about. There is a lot of quiet deals between Russia and Israel that you know nothing about. Решение о национализации этой библиотеки было принято советским правительством, первым советским правительством, и членами его являлись примерно на 80-85% евреи. Но они же, руководствуясь ложными идеологическими соображениями, шли тогда на аресты и репрессии и иудеев, и православных, и представителей других конфессий, мусульман. Они всех гребли под одну гребенку. И вот эти идеологические шоры и, э, и ложные идеологические установки, они... Важно, что ваш фонд многое делает для активизации контактов между народами России и Израиля. Помогает расширять сотрудничество между нашими странами в политике, экономике, культурно-гуманитарной и в других областях. И такую деятельность, разумеется, можно только приветствовать. Подчеркну, мы в России уделяем большое внимание развитию многоплановых взаимовыгодных отношений с государством Израиля. Стремимся выстраивать их в партнерском, конструктивном духе. Я без всякого преувеличения могу сказать с гордостью, что, наверное, такого уровня отношений между Россией и Израилем ну, никогда не было. Ну, если не... Вспоминать, конечно, самые, самые первые месяцы и, может, несколько пару лет образования государства Израиля. Мне напоминает то, на чем строится неприятие, ну, не знаю, какому-то этносу, скажем, антисемитизм. Значит, если кто-то чего-то не умеет делать, кто-то в чем-то э, проявляет неспособность решить проблемы, виноваты всегда евреи у антисемитов за, за их собственные промашки. Легче сказать, что мы не виноваты, это виноваты русские, они вмешались в наши выборы, а мы хорошие. Это вообще мне антисемитизм напоминает. Во всем евреи виноваты, понимаете? Сам, сам придурок так ничего сделать не может, евреи виноваты.